Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar in association with Men Improvement. And today is a very special episode because I have ex Premier League footballer, um, Welsh international, ex Welsh international, and mental health advocate. He's got a project called the David Cottrell Foundation. David, how are you doing, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm really excited to have you on. I'm actually, you know, quite chuffed that you've uh, accepted to come on <laughs> the invitation to come on yeah. the show. Um, there's lots. There's lots to talk about. Obviously, you're a high-profile um, guest. Um, you know, you've come from that background, and you, uh, you know, I noticed you because you were very outspoken online, and you showed so much courage and bravery. In it's almost like coming out. It's almost like you know, <laughs> it's like coming out the closet. <laughs> That's what it felt like. <laughs> yeah, it probably, it's probably harder to come out by actually being prepared to speak the truth and stand up against the establishment, which is what you've done, um, and. I really want to talk a little bit about that for you uh, and also kind of what's been going on in the last two years, especially, uh, and, you know, globally uh, and what that's meant for humanity, society. And then I thought at the end, we could talk about the mental health work that you've done, because I know you've, you know, suffered, you've come out and said you've, you've suffered mm. from mental health, depression, anxiety, um, you know, suicidal thoughts and stuff like that, which, you know, that is something that that's true to my heart as well, because I work with a lot of guys and, you know, I've lost a lot of friends to suicide, you know, and that's, yeah. that's you know, that's something that we don't talk enough about. But let's talk about coming out the, um, the, the you yeah. know, the, the, the closet in terms of speaking up and speaking out. So yeah, when did that start for you, David? Because obviously you're a Premier League footballer. Um, you're still actually playing football now, aren't you? And um, for Newton, is that right? No, I actually, I actually retired. Um, well, I've retired about three times, but okay. I, yeah, I, I stopped probably playing last November. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't play anymore. I was just getting, you know, I, I just right. don't have the passion and the love for it anymore. But mm. yeah, so I started speaking up against um, what I felt was a bit of a, a shit show for you know quite a while because quite early on it just things were not adding up to me. So I was. You know, I started playing um, semi-professional football for, for Barry Town, and, um, you know, we were in lockdown and we were told we couldn't change in the same dress room unless it was like maybe in groups of people of five or six. Then you weren't allowed in the showers altogether. You had to go in like twos and to go in the showers and things like that. So quite early on, just a few things were not ringing too much truth in my ears. And I just felt, you know, they were putting out a vaccination that they, they didn't really clinically prove if that was the right way of, of thinking and and all these rules that they had in place it was just it was just co constant tr uh, contradiction of, of everything that they were saying and you know I just I just thought well young fit healthy people why would you go and take an experimental drug without actually knowing anything about it and then when they started to push the agenda through you know certain public figures um, on social media and it was all just enrolling one thing after another and when I did a lot of research myself, I went away and, you know, studied, you know, a few things myself and a few group chats that I'm involved with, with other people who are really woke, if you like, to a lot of things over the, over the years. I just started to integrate and speak to people who are more knowledgeable than me to get an insight of what they've been doing. And then when you get down that rabbit hole, you realize that, it's it's not just from COVID of what they've been doing. They've been doing this for many many years, if not de well decades of of trying to go against humanity, of of trying to do certain th things to keep people unwell. Because it's a fact: if you have healthy people, they don't make these pharma uh, companies money. If you're sick, that you have, always have the returning customer to make them money. It's just it's just the way it is. Yeah, that is just the way it is, and it's funny that that is quite common sense. I would say for a lot of us you know like people that have kind of looked into this but the, the when you actually talk to your friends and family about this they, they've they've been programmed they've been conditioned to have that kind of that instant response of like calling you like you know tinfoil hat wearer conspiracy theorist it's yeah. almost like they've the, the system has created these nice little automatons <laughs> they've got them mentally so they they're the foot soldiers for them um, yeah. and so i'm sure you've had that experience and what was that like for you especially guys being quite a high profile person I mean, was that, um, I, what was that like? I, your to, be quite, to be quite honest, everything that I post surrounding anything to do with the COVID vaccination, to begin with, I got called every name under the sun. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I started to have a few people saying, oh, you know, some because I normally, I do post a few negative things. I've actually been shadow banned on Instagram. So this yeah. goes to show how controlled the whole fucking world is. 
Uh, I hope you don't mind me swearing, by the way. I no, swear go for it. No, it's all right. Although, um, but if you can swear, but if you like for the words like vaccination, I might have to put a little boop, you know. In yeah, just... be, yeah, be that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so for like obviously, you know, when I started speaking out against certain stuff, um, I was getting shadow banned. And believe it or not, I've I've been very vocal on the actual um, sex trafficking with kids and how many kids are going missing and why we're we not doing enough of this is as the why are the media not doing anything about it? because the media are quick enough to speak about the covid situation or things that will push the agenda to make money yet when you have kids being sexually abused or actually going missing what the fuck are you going to do about it because they're doing nothing and so when i've actually started speaking up about this on social media especially instagram i went from having 10 12 000 views on my stories to literally last week i had four views on the stories in 24 hours four and when I speak about this on Twitter, I get absolutely abused saying, you're clearly not censored because you're speaking on Twitter and blah, blah, blah. And it's just sometimes is that you're right, that people are stuck in the system. They've been programmed for so long. They actually genuinely believe that the governments give a fuck about them. And they think that they, they, they think the news are going to give them all the right things when they're actually not. Because what happened with Ukraine, of course, innocent people lose lives. That's and that's the, the most tragic thing about this. But when you have psychopaths who are actually in, involved and who are in charge of creating this environment, if you like, um, innocent people will get hurt. That's not what I'm going against. I'm just going against that. These people are so crazy. They'll do whatever they need to get to their agenda to keep the people below them in the system. You know, they, if you, if, the thing what I clocked onto about the, the COVID situation very early on is when we went into lockdown, it was great because we had the weather and, I was having barbecues all the time. I loved it with my family and, and so on. Um, but I kept myself to myself anyway. So I didn't really need people. I was still going on my dog walks. No one stopped me from seeing my children unless obviously, you know, my ex would be saying, you know, do you think we should do this and do that? Because I have to, I would have had to travel from Cardiff to um, England to go and get my daughter. And of course they stopped anyone traveling and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, you know, I wasn't going to miss my daughter's birthday and things that I get absolutely abused on social media saying you shouldn't be seeing your daughter, you shouldn't be seeing this and doing that. But when you speak about the COVID situation, people have been literally programmed to such a certain way, they forget all the bullshit that these people have actually come out and said. They said, if you didn't have the, if you had the vaccination, you wouldn't catch COVID. I always go to the point of, if my dog, well, my dogs, if my dog's got rabies, and they had the vaccination for rabies and they had it three or four times that year, I wouldn't give them a fucking vaccination. I'd want my money back from the vets, that's yeah, for of sure. Course. Because yeah. I'd be asking questions. But when you're having the vaccine and you're constantly getting COVID over and over again, why are people not asking these questions? It, it, it blows my mind, honestly. It's just, you know, it's crazy because that was one of the, the main uh, points of the propaganda was to say, look, we can all go back to normal if we get the jab, you know, stop yeah. the transmission you heard like Fauci and you know all the kind of the, the usual ones were coming out Trudeau and all the world leaders you know Ardern and Boris and everyone you know if you get the vaccine you can go back to normal it's going to stop you from from getting it and transmitting it then of course people I know took the jab and then within 24 hours got COVID you know it's as quick as that mm. and they're going oh, oh yeah but it's you know it's lucky that I did I did get it because imagine what would happen if I didn't get it you know like uh. the, the, the brainwashing is is really is really intense you know it's like it's serious and um and it's yeah, very I mean, intense and then but then you also have to think um of, of of Fauci I wouldn't say call him a doctor because he's literally fucking control people for god knows how yeah. long I can't believe the guy's not in prison but yeah. he 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 has literally said many um, years ago to do with the flu you know you're better off getting the actual um, yeah, illness so then yeah so he says that for one thing and then but then the, as you say the propaganda and the, the actual scare because what they do they just create people just to scare them to put them in fear because it's the same thing for what we're going through right now and they all you know, it's no coincidence that so many people are going to be sick going forward over Christmas and coming into the winter months is because You've had the vaccine, which would, uh, you know, have lowered your immune system. Flu season kicks in anyway. And then when they call them the, the twin demic or whatever they're coming out with these days. <laughs> yeah, the twin demic, yeah. People actually genuinely think, oh, my God, it's all going around, blah, blah, blah. But I'm a true believer. Um, when I was playing football, I used to pop, I used to pop painkillers like they were smarties because yeah. I had a bit of, my, bit of my cartilage come away with my knee. And I used to literally have to take tablets every day to probably get me through the training session and in my mind anyway and then you know to get through matches 
and they're just thrown around you know like if you go to the doctor you know can i have some yeah bosh there we go it's no kind of worries about it um which obviously they're just doing their job anyway and ultimately i wanted them because i want to play football but normally when i even used to have headaches or anything i never used to take tablets very rarely did i used to take paracetamol just for for that and still and now i've probably completely taken myself away from that so if i have a headache i just think right still go to the gym go and do a work workout go and go for a walk have water do do natural things and i think when you do that i think that's that's better in my personal well of course I, the, the, these doctors they're just they're just sales reps for the pharmaceutical industry that's all they are i mean when you go yeah. and see your when you go and see your gp like you should only really be going to see them if you've got a wound or something, you know, you just need to, need to yeah. have it like, cleaned up. To go there for actual, like, core health issues, it's the, it, should, it should be the last thing you do, you know. Um, so people don't seem to understand that, like, you know, they never ask about your nutrition, you know, how much sleep you're getting, your lifestyle. It's just like, have an antibiotic, you know, that's the kind of the general, they have a little wheel that they do, anti, you know, they just, you know, they pick the pharmaceutical out for, for you, you know what I mean? And it's just, you know, that's just the way it is. It's crazy because... It's crazy because like when you when you look at the lockdowns of where we went to lockdown, you know, you've got all these fast food companies opening first to sell you absolute shit, burgers, fries, whatever else. And you got gyms are closed. You actually you actually had owners of gyms getting fined and, and actually silenced on social media. Why? Because they're saying you should go to the gym to be healthy. It's crazy. I mm. the, the, and the and the fact that so many people were actually brainwashed by this. It's got to be one of the biggest fucking scams of all time. <laughs> well, I thought climate change was the biggest scam of all time, but this is that this is probably top two. Although saying that that climate change that is going to have uh, you know that watch the next few years with that one that's going to be the new one. I actually think they're going to do climate lockdowns. I think this is almost like a dummy run. I think they were trying this out. I think this is that they wanted to push this as far as possible because obviously it's a huge money making um, enterprise. But I think this is almost like a prerequisite towards the uh, the kind of the green you know agenda 30 of sustainability and i yeah. think their aim is to use that as the new larger model to um control they these these people these people talk about climate change you know you've got these big actors like leonardo, leonardo dicaprio and you've got the royal family of saying you know watch climate change blah blah, blah. but you, you're taking private fucking flights every other week or every other exactly. well, not every other week every every day mm -hmm. you're then on a big yacht so what is it one rule for the elite and then the the rule for the others that 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 is what has been put in place they yeah. they can do what they want and the rest mm. of society they have to follow rules and the so-called conspiracy theories that have been going around of mm. people are saying oh my god it's a conspiracy theory of of you speaking about covid but the ones who have actually spoken up they said about the digital id would be put put in place mm. and it's well on its way to do so and there's so also so many other yeah. agendas that they put on place. So it's not just purely, you know, the electrical cars kind of situation. You know, if you don't follow suit and don't listen to these people, you don't go to work to earn money. They'll turn your car off. And some yeah. people, some people listen to this and can people who've like minded mm -hmm. people like me and yourself. They'll think we're fucking crazy, but we're actually we haven't been proven wrong. No, yet. no, that's the thing. And it, it's annoying because people just throw out the, the term conspiracy theorists. But like I've spent a lot of time researching this. And what I'm saying isn't isn't coming from an idea that I've had sat in a darkened room. Like I've followed, yeah. I've connected dots and I've looked at actual government parliament papers and I've gone onto the official websites of some of these organizations like the World Economic Forum, for instance. And they're saying it, they're they're it's hidden in plain sight. They actually tell you what they're yeah. doing. And I think that's how they actually get away with it because um you would show someone they would say well, why why would they put it on their website if that was true and so that's almost yeah. like it's so under your nose that it's like you don't see it and i think that's part of the part of the game you know but you're right it's um this has been a the last two years has been like a, an iq test i think it's been an intelligence test and i think it's actually created quite a polarization it's created a a split amongst people you know i'm, I'm now which friendly. what they've always wanted <laughs> well i guess they have yeah i mean if they can cr constantly create a divide and conquer but it you know it's always as if it's almost as if I'm walking with my friends and family, but I'm in, we're in two different dimensions of yeah. reality, the way we perceive reality. It's, it's very strange. Um, I don't I'm, 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 sim I'm similar to you, you know, my parents, uh, I think I always wind up, well, I don't wind them up, but there's a bit of truth in it. I say, fuck me, you've had those, those vaccinations so quick. You must have camped outside the, the doctors. They were, they had them that quick. And, you know, my mum, she's had the uh, two vaccinations and a booster. And she's like, oh, I'm not going to have any more because my left-hand side hurt after my after the booster. 
And I said, well, how many more do you want? You've had three. There's, I, I don't know what you're trying to achieve from this, but um, of course, you know, the elderly would have been um, put in fear to have this if they've got certain of, you know, underlying health issues, please get it if you like got, or anything. So they, they've backed people into a corner. And the thing is, is that all oh, you have a lot of healthy people who young footballers, athletes, a lot of started dropping down and having cardiac arrest. Mm. And, you know, you, you have you have the certain thick people, I would say, because people are actually acting fucking thick out there right now, which is mm. blows my mind. And they're like, well, it's always been there. It's always been happened to footballers. But the percentage rise that has happened is absolutely crazy. And the mm. fact that you don't see it and there's they're not going to take no blame for it. They're going to do exactly what they're doing. They'll probably pay like a court case of get a little fine or, or not a little fine, but people have already been getting payouts from it because they've, they have they know full well that these were not clinically tested and proven to, to be released into these people. What, it's, it's, it's mental because they actually demonised people for having a cough, but they're normalising people dropping dead with heart attacks. Yeah. Or, or even worse, they were demonising people who had no symptoms whatsoever. <laughs> they were like the, the ones that were born with original sin and then people are like you know dropping left right and center and it's just completely you know brushed under the carpet i mean even you see defibrillators everywhere now if you go to your train local train station it's there yeah. like a high streets it's there that was never there two years ago but they're popping up everywhere now you even hear i was in the gym uh yesterday and i could hear you know if someone's if someone's having a heart attack there's defibrillators here you know they're talking about this they're normalizing they're normalizing myocarditis in in you know on our ad tv adverts stuff like that but it's almost <laughs> as if it's just not people just aren't seeing that it's just really weird um but uh yeah it's 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 been an odd one it's been a strange couple of years what's been the response from have you had any people ex footballers who have sort of or anyone sort of said to you by the way dave good work you're doing mate you know but i can't say anything is that the vibe like do you get that I've had loads of people, to be quite honest, like 95% of the messages that I get personally are mm. very positive. At the beginning, yeah. people thought I was a fucking lunatic. Mm. Um, and then, you know, it has got a lot better. And especially recently, you know, there's no, you get the odd. I find Twitter very toxic. Oh, assessment, you know, mate, assessment. Twitter, honestly, I could put a brand new Lamborghini on there in black mm. and there'd be a dickhead saying, shit color shit car that's just the way it is but you, you know on twitter it's i find twitter the most toxic place whereas instagram um a lot of great feedback a lot of people are starting to wake up mm. do you know what if, if you've had the vaccine and you've and you've had it that's that's fine everyone's got a mm. choice my 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 bio's opinion was always pro cho uh, pro choice i didn't want to be mm. forced to have it i didn't want my children to be forced to have it so that i was just pro choice and that was it um and so when i've started to speak up about i had some footballers a lot of footballers and follow me and message me saying you know i've unfollowed you or be just because you're speaking about the maxwell and epstein case which i was talking about with the world mm -hmm. with the royals etc mm -hmm. um and the vaccine and i just thought so you don't want to know about you being basically poisoned with a vaccine that is full of shit and and you also don't want to be hearing about what is actually the children trafficking that's going on in the world. Mm. So I just thought, don't follow me then, because clearly I'm speaking too much facts for you to even fathom right now. So mm. that's absolutely fine. So so I have divided opinions of certain people that I'd expect to kind of be a little bit tougher when it comes to certain situations. And, you know, I have p people who message me in the very, in the public domain right now of, at the elite level of their sport mm. and they're so intrigued and they're so educated about certain mm. stuff of topics it's just the sad reality is they can't speak up against it because they're going to get shut down censored on social media and, and social media is, is a big platform for people to earn a living right and yeah, course, to yeah. promote what to, prom to promote what they're doing and unfortunately i'm really heavily <laughs> censored which i can't <laughs> i can't do anything from like my job's mm. point of view from that for that thing but I'm just I'm just happy just to kind of like if I can help one person a day, whether that's with mental health or trying to educate someone, mm. um, then that's great. It's it has divided opinions on this, the mental health side of things just purely because people say, well, you're a mental health advocate. You've got your own foundation to, of mental health, but you're talking about certain topics that are going to trigger people. But my response is 
the vaccine has caused a lot of damage to pregnant women. And I've had a lot of women message me that has, you know, they've had miscarriages or they can't get pregnant because there's a certain vaccine that has, has done to them. And so from my perspective, I think, well, that's also a point of protecting people with mental health. Why should that, this not be yeah. spoken about? Because these women are immensely going through hell right now because they want to have children or they've had a miscarriage. This is part of mental health too. We can't just sugarcoat stuff that is actually going on in the world right now because there's a lot of evil shit that's going on. Mm. You yeah, know, absolutely there is. And I, you know, thank you for doing that. Thank you for speaking out. I mean, I know there's not many high profile people speaking out, but there's a, there's a sprinkling. I mean, Matt Letizia, bless him, has obviously <laughs> come out and he's lost his job. Do you know what I mean? And um, he's absolutely, you can see he's wide awake. Like he knows, he knows. Oh, he's so true. wide awake. And it's just so, it's so typical that they've kept Paul Merson on. Like, and he, and Paul Merson is trying to get the moral high ground over Letizia saying he shouldn't have said that, you know, he shouldn't have done all that, you know, but, but they, Letizia, he's just, all he's done is want to come out and speak the truth about what's been going on. And, you know, do you know just... what, like the, the, I, I don't know exactly what has been said, but said between um, those two guys, I speak to yeah. Matt um, quite, quite often. Uh, yeah. Well, I say often, but you know, every, yeah. every few weeks or whatever, we just touch base and, and yeah. so on. He's, he's a great, he's a great person. He's very, mm. very intelligent. Mm. um he's not he's not your ordinary footballer who is <laughs> yes. kind of like just yeah. constantly he doesn't what I mean by that I wouldn't you know there are obviously clever footballers out there I'm just saying that he doesn't just talk about football 24 7 he has another string to his to his bow if you like where he is very educated he's very clever he's done a lot of research and do you know what I love about him is that he's Sky is trying to silence him to say right if you don't change your opinion then we're gonna have to take you off air and so on and the fact that he stuck to his ground and thought, fuck you, and just continued in what he's about, I love that. Mm. Um, and you can't fault that in a person. How can you fault that of just sticking to your actual guns and kind yeah. of like sticking to your morals and that's it? Well, you're doing that as well. I mean, I was going to say, could you, have, could you have been as outspoken if you were still playing football, do you think? Or do you still feel... No, I don't think. No. I think I, I think I probably would have spoken up um, because I was always very outspoken in the football world anyway in, in the dress room and certain stuff to managers that's why I probably wasn't flavor, flavor of the week all the time because if there's anything that I, I'd always speak what I wanted to say that was on my mind and stick up for my teammates if certain things were not going right or whatever else and I, so I was always kind of like a rebel if you like to that mm -hmm. point and if things didn't sit well with me I probably would have said something yeah um I would have found it a lot easier speaking about COVID and the corrupt world that way rather than speaking about mental health. I didn't speak about mental health when I was playing just be mm. purely because it was just wasn't a thing. You mm. know, I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to jeopardize a, a new contract wow. or and things like that. It was never kind of like, a, it, I didn't feel like it was a safe environment for me to talk about that topic. That's interesting. The fact that like you couldn't talk about something that was clear, that was clearly a big, a big issue, you know? um that was affecting you at the time i mean maybe we should sort especially of especially yeah that. especially my especially my drinking was a, was a major mm. issue you know you, mm. you 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 know clubs would know my agents the amount of agents that would say to me fuck me you love a night out this is why such and such club doesn't want to sign you because they think you're you love a night mm. out i did i did love a night out but i was drinking a lot for a reason because i was you know maybe mentally not fucking just take it certain the way I felt mentally away because when I started to drink it was just thinking right I can just deal with those problems tomorrow it's just like a quick fix for me um and that was just my thing I just and then eventually towards the back end of my career football was getting in the way of my drinking and mm. I just didn't didn't love the game anymore I just always felt there's something else out there for me other than football and what I find quite intriguing is that when I checked into rehab, which I didn't even know. Uh, when I checked into rehab, they were like, oh, you're here for drinking cocaine and drugs? I was like, no, I've never touched any other drug other than alcohol. And he said, oh, wow, you're the only footballer that's checked into rehab without with just drink. And I thought, wow, well, I didn't see any of my teammates do any other drugs other than drink. I must have been just oblivious to it. So, and I think that's what kind of is the thing for me is when I get, and it's even on social media, when I'm speaking out about these things, people are quite quickly to say, oh, you must be back on that drink again because you're, you're full of shit, you're thick, you're this, you're that. And do you know what? If that's your opinion of me being wrong and that's thick, but please, please 
don't be taking addictions for granted because there's people that are out there who are suffering or losing lives off of addiction. You've got some fucking muppet who's chatting shit on social media saying, you know, or oh, you've had a drink again or you've been sniffing again. But I just thought, I didn't even answer back to say, oh, I didn't even sniff in the first place, mate. I just thought I can't be asked if that's what you think because I'm four years sober in February and to go to rehab and to try and build yourself up from the bottom, it's been mm-hmm. tough. And, and and many people have done it as well but well mm. many people have tried and not many people have succeeded so it's not for the faint-hearted when you want to go and try and like get your life back on track and bounce back from where certain situations that are being self-inflicted mm. um and then when you're taking ownership of that you can't you know when people kind of just put you down and stuff i just laugh in the end because i just think you're, you're mm. a lot of rubbish <laughs> yeah you just sort of like you just got to block them out I mean, do, um, can I ask, did the, which came first for you? Did you have sort of mental health issues like depression and that kind of thing first? And that led you to sort of drinking more? Or would you say you were just like drinking a lot? And then that, because I know when I've been drinking a lot, that adds, that actually sort of magnifies any sort of little thing that I've got going on. And then I tend to just like drink more to kind of mask over the top of it. Yeah. I've definitely had that, especially when I've been traveling and been on my own, you know, traveling abroad. It's almost like a comfort blanket, um, you know, mm. to, for that feeling. But was that something which came first for you, if you don't mind me asking? So I I was um, I didn't know about this until looking back when I started to edu- educate myself about mental health a bit more. But when I was 13, 14, I was always I was always wanted to be with people in a crowd. I had like great mates and so on. But I always felt quite alone. Mm. Um and I was always searching for perfection. So when I didn't actually train to it um certain standard i'd actually smash my boots against my shins with like the studs so i just thought well if anyone sees a cut they'll just think i've got tackled because i'm training like three or four times a week i'm playing football matches at a young age i you know tackles are flying in it happens and so i was always searching for perfection and even into my adult life right now sometimes i feel fuck is that good enough but just purely because i'm always searching for that perfection of of kind of certain things and and when I was very young, you know, if I didn't have a good game or if I played well, my dad would be like, well, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And and sometimes as a, as a child and if not as an adult, we don't have the answers because no one goes out in life in general to, to make mistakes, to have a shit day. And when I'd have a bad match, I would hear the end of it for four hours. So if I was playing in London against Chelsea and I'd had to come back home, I was in Bristol City's academy and I'd travel back to from Cardiff, you know, my dad would would um just hammer me just oh, literally really? hammer me just yeah you were shit today this and that and then it just kind of like the pressure was very high it was high stakes you know mm. um and also on the flip side of things he's like my biggest he's my biggest critic but also my biggest kind of you know supporter mm. and you know on the flip side of things, you know, he'd get back home, he'd go down the pub and he wouldn't speak to me then for about <laughs> two days. And just like looking back and I just think that's not fucking normal. Like mm. to, to deal with that as a kid, is not normal. And mm. then when I obviously later on, when I started playing football and, and so on, I got, you know, I, I had divorces. I was, you know, really low after divorce of not being able to see my kids and seeing and certain challenges. And then you still have to perform to that elite level. So the fans kind of, I think that footballers are more often not robots and we don't have any feelings. So when a footballer's having a divorce, oh, fuck it, he's a footballer, he's on X amount of money a week. But they don't realise you still have to go through those emotions and then still perform at a high level. Mm. Um, and they're just kind of like the pressures that you'd have to go through, you know. And and especially after my first divorce, I was um, I started to drink heavily a lot. And it didn't matter if I was playing in midweek I would still go and have a drink I get absolutely steaming I still perform at a good level and I was just one of those ones where I could still train and, and do well and then you know the physios when I was at Birmingham in particular they would smell alcohol on me but they would say oh just stay in for second day recovery don't want the manager to smell alcohol on you and so my alcohol was never addressed in a professional manner, if that makes sense. It was never kind of like, you've got a drinking problem, Cots. Can we pull you to one side? Is there any help we can give you? But towards the back end of my career, it was kind of like, well, you speak up too much. You like to go out. You can fuck off and be someone else's problem at another club. Mm. So for that reason, I never felt safe. If I ever said to a manager, look, 
I'm mentally not feeling great, but the only time I feel free is playing on a Saturday or Tuesday in midweek because that's the only time I did feel free was playing football. Other than that, I just, I was very down. I was not in a good place. Um, certain things happened in my life, as I say, self-inflicted and t- I take full responsibility for, but also I was in a bad place before. So I was trying to mask over so much and try and put on that, you know, show, if you like, for the for the public domain or to show that certain lifestyle that I had, but deep down I was in, in a really dark place. And I don't think there's many managers out there, hand on their heart, if they had a footballer who was suffering with mental health, would you still trust him? Would you still play him on mm. when it comes to the crunch of playing a football match? More often than not, not the answers would be no, because, and if they said yes, I think most of them would be chatting shit because um, footballers... You know, it's not the the environment is not created for you to talk out and speak that way. I know there's a lot of tick box exercises out there with certain organisations saying, "Yeah, we're helping with mental health, we're doing this, we're doing that." But when it comes to crunch, are you doing enough to support these these young people, especially the footballers who are who are being released? They they want to be a footballer all their life, then they be then they're released next year. You know, um, no disrespect to any jobs that I mentioned, but then you become a postman or you become a painter and decorator and, and then you're not a footballer anymore. And people want to see people fail. The UK culture and most of the world's cultures, they want to see people fail. So you then get that pressure of, of that. So that's why I think football football and other organisations, you're actually doing enough, enough to support these young people. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's a great message. And maybe it's going to take a few years for that to happen. It could be that it's like, this is like a slow, slow burner, if you like, because these things like you have to have what the, you have to have one person start to talk about this and then it sort of gives the courage for another person to come out. And then it sort of starts to build up a little bit of a domino effect. And then it, then it sort of hit reaches a point of critical mass where it sort of then comes out and people are starting to talk about it in the mainstream. But would you say it's still a little bit, it's still quite taboo. It's still a little bit brushed under the carpet, right? Yeah, I think it's it's definitely brushed into the carpet. I'll tell you what I'm not, I'm not really liking at the moment is the, the actual abuse that Harry Maguire is getting. Yeah. Because, you know, you get all these people on social media and in life where, you know, you have a celebrity who takes their own life and they're like, you know, we must be kind, we must be this, we must be that. But Harry Maguire, the stick and shit that he's taking mm. right now, if you, if you don't rate him as a footballer, that's absolutely fine. But to hammer him constantly, day in, day out on social media platforms, and it's just mm. every news outlet, you know, it's plastered on Sky Sports or it's plastered on, you know, to do with the pundits and stuff. I just think there's a human being there mm. and what he's dealing with right now, he's, event- he's he, of course he's going to be on social media and seeing this stuff or his family members are going to be seeing this stuff. So it's not right for everyone around him. But then you've got, but no one's sticking up for him then. But what happens if he did decide that it was affecting mentally? Then you'd have all these fucking idiots come out of the woodworks and say, yeah, you know, be kind, be nice. But they were just slating him on social media mm. not so long ago. Mm. So, of course, everyone is entitled to their opinion. Everyone can have free speech. And if they want to say he's not me, you know, he's shit or, or any player's not doing it or not in great form, that's absolutely fine. But you don't have to keep targeting someone every hour, every minute of every day. I think it's absolutely crazy. And that just pretty much sums up the whole mm. public of, of, the, of the UK public, really, and actually the news, the news, because one minute he was the best thing since sliced bread when Man United wanted to sign him mm. for a, a world record mm. fee of the defender. And all of a sudden, you're on his shit, but you don't understand what that could be doing for him mentally because Mm. 95 or 99 percent of this population wouldn't be able to deal with what he's going through right now because he's obviously an elite athlete and he's you know he's dealing with stuff mentally but yeah. i'd like to see joe joe blogs on the on the street dealing with the pressures that he has mm. because they wouldn't handle they wouldn't handle it for two seconds no, they and wouldn't. i just think it's an i think it's an absolute joke right. to be quite honest no you're right and also it could even be subjective i mean it might be something very tiny that sets someone off you know that's the thing right i mean it doesn't have to be um, a huge orchestrated effort to kind of knock this person down. If someone's quite sensitive and they are that way mentally inclined to f- feel certain things, then it could be just some. You know, it, I know that I I get I might get triggered if someone sends me a message, shows a, a stranger just on Instagram. Yeah. So what's this going to be? You know, so that 
we don't know what's going on for every individual. They could have their own experience where they're suffering just from something that seems on the surface quite, you know, innocuous. Um, and that's that's the thing we don't know of mental health. I mean, it could be something that can be affecting someone, even though you'd think this person has their life in order and they're actually getting a lot of praise even. That's the thing, isn't it, with yeah. mental health? Well, that's the thing, you know, with with um, someone, you know, like an athlete, like Maguire's in and obviously a lot of money, yeah. And when I, when I, well, even when I've spoke about um, mental health, and of course I've never earned any of the, the money that Maguire's on, for example, and you know, everyone always just seems to think, well, if you're on X amount of money a week, that should that's fine then. Yeah. But then everyone always has that stigma surrounding a footballer. But then when you look at Robin Williams, for example, mm. who would be a, a lot richer than most footballers in the world, and he suffered, everyone was like you know oh my god it's so sad that robin williams is going through it. of course it's so sad because you have one of the most talented guys that's ever graced this earth and he's so funny so talented going through that clearly masking problems behind obviously his, his real emotions of what's going on mm. inside and it's extremely sad of course of course that is my my point being is that but when it comes to a footballer that should be okay because he's on thousands of pounds a week mm. yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. There's that masking. Of, oh, you know, their lifestyle is absolutely in order. So therefore they can't have any problems. Do you think that your depression, let's say, was sport related? Because you, I don't know if you know about Ronnie O'Sullivan. He He's quite open about his um, depression. Yeah. But he actually initially said it was it was connected to his sport. So he said he used to have snooker depression. And, um, you know, when he wasn't performing, he used to like really get down on himself about it. And uh, and then he learned to be a lot more stoic about it and, and manage his emotions and um, then he worked with Steve Peters who was like a psychologist and he, he helped sort of control his they call it the monkey mind but for you was the depression intrinsically linked to the sport and the performance or would you say this is a sort of a lifestyle thing for you or what was it probably a bit of both I think it's literally it would always be a bit of both I think mm. for for most footballers I can only speak for myself but mm. you know when there's nothing like being a footballer where you could have scored literally the 90th minute winner and then on a Saturday and then on Tuesday you literally miss a penalty and you then go from hero hero to villain mm -hmm. in a space of a few days and it's literally like a roller coaster so of course you know the way I always feel that the best athletes in the world are the ones who can control them their control themselves when they go into big events or they got a penalty in the 90th minute the ones who compose themselves and they stay really calm are the ones who go to that elite level of course they have the talent as well but the ones who were literally stone cold like that where they they're really you know for example like michael jordan of course they're freaks of nature but tiger woods mm -hmm. people who can handle that pressure on a day-to-day -day basis there's very few who can do that and perform at the elite level. And, you know, of course, they'd be hard on themselves about their their performance, but they'd be able to bounce back quite quickly. Whereas the rest of us would be kind of yeah. like, are we taking that a little bit harder than most? Um, you know, you're a little bit tentative then when you go on like the next game and so on. And to be quite honest, the pressure that you get not only then from yourself, the manager and the fans as well, of course that can cause, mm. that can pay, uh, play a big impact as well. But genuinely, I didn't really allow the fans to really affect me that much. Mm. It was always kind of like the perfection that I was searching for myself. Mm. And if I, if I had a bad game, especially later on, I used to, I used to think, oh, fuck it. it is what it is. Let's just bounce back. Let's do better next time. Let's do better in training and so on. Whereas in my younger days, I would get a little bit affected by it because it was new territory for me because mm. I wasn't, you know, used to maybe getting a boo off a fan or used to do, doing this and that because I made my debut when I was 16. You know, I was, I left school not so long before that. And next thing you know, you're playing against grown men in front of thousands of people. And when I, when I look back and I think, wow, I was in, and I was in the Welsh squad at like 17 as well. And I was training in the Welsh squad when I was 15, 16 with the first team. Um, you know, that's huge pressures really on a, on a young kid. And I just used to, I just took it in my stride because that's what I always wanted to do. So I don't know any different. Mm -hmm. But when I look at my son, who's 15 now, and if I would have said to him, you'd have been playing with grown men 
and they have been telling you to fuck off and you're shit, you're this and that, to be better, do put put the ball in front of your feet, not behind you, or, or the, otherwise you get slated for little details. I think that's what clearly helped me. And I think we need a bit more than that. But I just look at my son, I think you wouldn't last two seconds and have that off grown men. <laughs> so <laughs> it is a mad environment. And I do agree with what Ronnie O'Sullivan is saying mm. because, you know, it does affect you any sport if you're not playing the best of your capability and you know your form's up and down and you're not going through the right stages of life off the pitch as well it obviously has damaging effects Mm. yeah absolutely he actually says in in his interviews that he's reached a place where he can play with total abandonment now without worrying about winning or, or the perception of him and he says that's like the the mental mastery that he has he never had that um, you know, when he was coming through, because he always had to prove that he was the best all the time. Now yeah. he, just, he, he says, I really don't care if I go out in the first round, I can just chill out and do my running. So he's in a very powerful position where he really doesn't care about the result, but he still plays with it, the same gusto, you know, the same uh, yeah. artistry that he does. So that's that's good for him. But um, but the, the mental health stuff. So, I mean, you know, obviously the, there's going to be a lot of guys watching this. And, um, you know, I've lost, I would say, four guys to suicide who i've known you know that's a lot of people you know and that's um yeah it's yeah. a lot of guys and i think there is it there is a crisis with men's mental health and you know suicide amongst you know male suicide and um you know i would like lo- i would like there to be more awareness about this and i thank you for what you're doing with your um, foundation as well what do you think the i want to just for this little section here what, what would be the the warning signs for a lot of guys and what would be the steps they need to take? And, you know, can you, if you can put yourself in their shoes, because you've been there, like, what would you say to some of these guys that are going through that? I think the best advice that I would say is, you know, talking from my own experience is, mm. I remember when I, when I spoke about mental health, I spoke with um, a journalist that I, that I trust from, he was actually working with the BBC at the time, but he's mm. done a lot of work with the, with the Welsh FA and I trust him. He's a good, he's a good person. Mm. And so we spoke about this and he was always open with his um, situation as well. So we were on like, you know, quite friendly terms. And uh, he said, Oh, look, come and do this interview with me. And so I spoke about it and I didn't realize he was going to go all over the UK. Mm. Um, after speaking about mental health. But when I spoke about it, it was just a huge weight off my shoulders. And so I would always advise someone that they might seem to think that it's a, a massive problem that they have with themselves, that we create bigger scenarios and bigger problems than what actually it is. Mm. Um, of, of course, they, you know, they're going to be depressed or stressed. But when you when you speak about this, this subject, you speak about it, you just feel better knowing that someone's listening and you're getting it off your chest. Mm. And... When I decided to do that, I started to feel a little bit better, and I just start, I just think routine is key for anyone, mm-hmm. suffer, any any human being. Full stop. I think routine is key, whether and especially in particular if you're suffering with mental health or any addiction, I think routine is massively um, underrated, really, because we we need that. Um, and when you start to, I always said to myself, when I'm fearing something and I'm having anxiety. If I run away from it, the fear and the anxiety just creates more problems and it gets bigger and bigger. But when you step towards the fear and the anxiety, so if you go towards the fear, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So when you do that and start taking control of your life, because ultimately it comes down with with ourselves, because you can, you're going to get advice off people with mental health or, or addiction, but ultimately we need to be, or, and we want to be better for ourselves. And when I started to take control of that, that's when I knew I actually didn't want to die. I wanted to be here for my children. I did want to be around for them. Ultimately, that was my main focus um, because there were stages. I did try to take my own life. And, you know, and it was, it was a brutal kind of like mindset that I was in. I was just in a dark place. Wouldn't get out of bed. I was fucked for days. Um, I put like on a certain mask to kind of like cover up who is, you know what who i'm seeing i go into training they're like morning cots how are you are you good and i'm like yeah yeah i'm good and i remember i i punched a mirror actually one time in a, in a party and i was bleeding all night and i actually wore gloves um to, to go into training it was like 16 70 degrees outside i didn't need gloves 
but because I wanted to hide it again from what I was mentally feeling like, I was trying to keep myself in the team and so on. You just cover up those cracks and the cracks get bigger and bigger. But when you reach out for help, it's the best thing for you because that weight is lifted off your shoulders and you just feel that, do you know what? I've done the first step. I've admitted that I'm actually suffering. But what can you do next to, to make to, to feel better? And whether that's like speaking to a professional, um, you know, a psychotherapist, a counselor, whatever that might be, you know, that'll just that'll just set set you in good stead. Because I always think that when you go to the gym, like people don't expect to have a six pack if you don't go to the gym. Mm. So when you go to the gym, you get better and so on. And, you, and then when you speak to counselors, you feel you're putting the work in place, if you like, to make yourself stronger mentally. And that's why I go to the gym or I do home workouts because mm. I, I have that routine to feel better about myself. Um, mm. And that's what I always try. That's what I always trying to do. No, you're right. Actually, if you go to the gym, you'll find the majority of guys in there have just had a breakup or, you know, they're, they're doing it to exactly. give themselves. It is, it's, it's to give yourself a sense of accomplishment and, and, and seeing something and growth. I think for us guys, for me, this is, this is what I think anyway. I think what gives us good mental health is actually um, seeing ourselves moving forward and growing. And there's some kind of thing that's building um, some kind yeah. of purpose, some kind of trajectory. I think when we lose the trajectory and that's all tied into the routine, when we lose that, if we're not having any kind of utility or impact, that's when I think it starts to go. What is the, What have I got here? You know, what, what is there? Um, and that's when it really yeah, definitely. Gets, you know, I think as well, I think it's ultimately when you when you are going through that recovery process as well, it's, it's mm. important that you're happy within yourself. Don't rely on someone else's happiness to, to make you happy. So if you're in a, if you're bouncing from relationship to relationship and you're still not solving your own problems, you're going to put your problems onto some other person then. And ultimately, you're not getting better. Mm. So it's, it's really important that you take that time to reflect and kind of like get better within to then progress then in in whatever else you want to do with life because ultimately your well-being your self-care is is the main is the main thing and if you're right then you can be there for others um mm. you know and when i started to do that when i checked into rehab they they put that in in place they give you a routine i had no routine and structure anymore because i left football i was just doing what the fuck i wanted mm. i was going out drinking and i didn't care about that and i i loved that at the stage but looking back you know, we do need routine. And I was so used to that because everything was so regimental. But um, for example, when I was in rehab, we, we wake up, we reflect, we do meditation and then we go into the gym and you had to be in the gym by a certain time. And if you weren't, then there'd be consequences. So when that's in place and you set the foundations up right, that's when you can start to build your life back up. That's better. And all of, all of a sudden that fear and that anxiety is, is, is not as big anymore. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then if it does arise again, which, I'll, you know, I still have bad days, but I know how to, you know, quickly get back on track and focus a little bit better. I can deal with it more because I've had those foundations put in place. Yeah, that's really good advice. And it's sort of simple building blocks as well, because sometimes it can be quite overwhelming. I've gone through this where you just think, I don't know where to start. It could just be something very small that you can just create into, put into yeah. a routine. Even just something like, you know, have a bath. I know it sounds really small, but yeah. Like, but just say, but just giving yourself and then building up from that, you know, and just and just building up from that feeling of like, I can't be bothered to even, you know, have a shower today, whatever. Just setting yourself to do that. And then after that, feel like you've just accomplished that. And then you can go on to do the next thing and create a little bit of routine, even if it feels very, you know, too simple in a way that even that kind of routine is just a good building block for people that are just really can't do anything. Yeah, definitely. I think that's what I always say when, you know, when I used to spend so much time in bed when I was really in a dark place. Now that if I have a bad day or something, I always say to my, look, myself, look, it's a bad day, not a bad life. So I just fucking crack on. Yeah. And I don't allow that that one bad day to then materialize into the second or third day. As you say, if it's if you're in bed for the one day and you don't get out, you don't shower or anything. If you then wake up the next day, mm. you brush your teeth, you shower, you then go for a walk. That's that's a that's progress mm. so don't be so hard don't be so hard on yourself when certain things and you haven't managed to get out of bed but if you do something better the next day then after that if you've been for a walk that walk a little bit longer eat healthy mm. go and have a little run or whatever it might be listen to music whatever your interests are because everyone's different you need to find that kind of like niche that you, that is important to you 
Absolutely. And I, I think sport is a great one as well. I mean, it does, the endorphins do help massively. Um, you know, well, that's my experience anyway, like playing racquetball just helps me, you know, puts, yeah. me in a good, puts me in a good mood just from the endorphins. And also, I think some, there's also something about a, a sense of belonging that helps and being around people. Did that, did that not, did that aspect of football not help you? Do you not think like having like, you know, guys a bit of banter and, you know, feeling like there's a it, shared purpose. Did that not sort of help your mental health at all? It did, but I was actually, you know, I'd be in a room full of people. I'd feel quite alone. Mm. So even if we had a locker, if we had a locker room or a change room of like 25, 30 players, mm. there'd be times I just, I'd feel alone. And I could even go into meeting rooms and these conferences, there'd be thousands of people there. And I'd still feel quite alone. And now it's quite mad that mm. I could actually, I am on my own most of the time. Mm. And I actually feel more present with myself than I've ever I have before. So mm. you need to be present within because that's all that matters because some people can get lost in the crowds and feel quite alone, which I did. I felt alone wow. being around people. Mm. Um, and now I feel a little bit more at ease and a little bit happier within, but that's taken, it's mm. not, it's not an easy, it's not an easy fix. You know, when you want to do better and, and be, be better, it, it is, it is, you know, is t- uh, challenging times, but it's all worth it because mm. ultimately, like four years ago, I wanted to end my life and take mm. my own life, and, and here I am. I'm still present. I'm still a parent, and and so on. So, yeah, that's, good that's man. Like, I'm glad yeah. you. I'm glad you're here, man. Like you know, and you've got a great message. I, sometimes I think you've got to go down into the quagmire to come up and like and, and share these gifts. I think because the the gifts that we share are often a reflection of the darkness that we've gone through. So obviously, you know, you've gone through that. And now you're you've got your foundation now. Um, do you want to share, David, a little bit about that and you know what the aims are with that and how you're helping people? Yeah, we're trying to. We first off, we we you know we wanted to help locally in Cardiff, um, mm. especially because there just wasn't no help here. You know, a lot of people started when I spoke about it. Um, mm. My my partner in the foundation said, "Look, we have loads of people suffering locally as well. It'd be great if we can set something up." And we set something up, and um, so we just try and. We did have amazing meeting rooms, actually, where it was kind of, you know, people would come and share their story. We'd have a coffee um, or tea or anything. And we just share each other's story to kind of like create that environment that you're not alone. And this is the the other thing that really fucking pissed me off about the lockdowns, because before lockdowns, we had this one one guy in particular, you know, we had because we would send people over to my partner's gym where they would recover and kind of create that routine of going to exercise then they, they would come over to the meeting room so they're getting kind of the mental well-being um mm. covered and they're actually physical activity as well and this one guy was really in a bad place and he eventually managed to um you know lose weight that he wanted to he was getting better mm. he stopped drink. he gets stopped drinking he was mentally getting you know a lot better and then we were in lockdown for a little while. And then we had our first meeting back there and he put on three stone and he's back drinking and he's back mentally feeling like shit. Mm. And that's what really annoyed me because we had these meetings in place. And of course, with the pandemic, you know, it kind of hit that. Um, and, you know, we help a lot to do with, with kids to kind of keep them actively fit. We go into schools um, we try and, you know, of course we don't, we don't have many professionals in our foundation because of course everyone you know there's so many busy there's volunteers that they don't they got other jobs and the current uh, current climate right now is that they have to put food on the table for their own kids so they can't really afford to give up time um, to help others unfortunately but we do point people in the right direction to get the professional help Um, and you know we are looking to do more things that to help locally to keep to even you know help people have food and and mm. you know kids who are not getting fed in the morning the amount of kids that go to school that don't get breakfast off their off their parents because of certain situations because they might not afford it or they're single mothers or they're single fathers and and so on so we try to help that way we try and help the homeless we go around to help the homeless um at christmas times we help out a lot to even put food on the table for for families like last year me and my partner we were you know we were rushing around to make sure that they had food on the table for for christmas because there was one single mother in particular didn't have anything so we dropped the food late on you know christmas eve and so on and so we, we do a lot of things in the background that we actually don't 
show too much on social media and, and so on because we know we're actually working quite hard to make sure that we, we try and do more. Um, hopefully in the coming months, we will be able to, to build on that with um, a few you know applications that we've applied for and, and we can hopefully be able to, to give, give back to more families in particular that they need. Amazing. Yeah, because that's, I, I didn't realise you did that much, that so much, like kind of diverse stuff there. Um, but yeah we we kind of especially with the homeless because it has like mm. quite a close mm. place in my heart just purely because most people who are on the streets they're addicts and yeah. of course i'm on recovery for alcoholism so it kind of touches a little it touches me quite a lot when i go out and see these people who are homeless that you mm. know they're all they'll say look I, this one person a guy that i spoke to he was um you know, addicted to heroin. He had a five bedroom house. He had two cars. He had four kids and a wife. And within the space of three months, he lost everything. And he's crawling around mm. on the floor where he's injected his knees of, of heroin and, and so on. It's just like the, you know, his addiction has taken over. And that's kind of like, and I just think sometimes, fuck, you know, mm. that could have been, that could have been me because mm. I'm an addict as well. I know. Cause I, when I lived in Brighton, I actually did a little um, film series called homeless half hour where I took, um, homeless people from Brighton because there's a lot of them there and we'd go and we'd go and I'd take them for, for lunch and then they would tell me their story oh, amazing. and a lot of these guys they were they had top jobs like one guy was like a top yeah. chef and his story was that he had a housemate who was into heroin and um, and I don't know how it started but he started doing the heroin from his housemate and then he started to miss right. one job he missed one he, he missed he was late for one job you know for, for to get into the kitchen for one time and then next time and then that was it he lost his rent money you know he mm. couldn't afford the rent they was out on the street probably within a couple months and wow. um, and then he was on the street and then some guy just during the night just toe punted him in the face so he's got all his front teeth missing it's just unbelievable isn't it like someone would do that but that's just how that just shows you what things are like you know he's just lying there it just absolutely desperate and some guys just kicked him straight in the face he's lost all his teeth and he's like, no, but I'm I'm sorting this out. I'm I'm coming clean. I'm I'm getting off this, and I'm really working yeah. hard, and I'm doing this, you know. So, yeah, it's and a lot of the homeless people I said they're actually quite talented people. A lot of them are like artists that were like very talented, and you just wouldn't expect that people just have no idea about that. So, um, so yeah, I'm glad. That's what I. It. That's what I was. That's what I always think. That's quite crazy about um, you know, when people have addiction, especially with mm. alcohol, and you do a bit of research and you do certain stuff and you go into the meeting rooms, you you know as you mentioned there you have people who are coming in and people expect people to come in who's a guy who's got long hair um scruffy clothes literally smelling of pee or whatever but you mm. have like people coming in a suit and a boot but they just come from being a lawyer and, and so mm. on so uh, addiction can can harm anyone yeah don't, don't be fooled don't be fooled to think that you know addiction or mental health can't touch any particular person you're not fucking untouched no one's untouchable and mm. you know if it's not if mental health or addiction is not affecting you i can fucking guarantee it's, it's affecting someone else very close to you yeah 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 good stuff man yeah david chat ch thanks man thanks for coming on it like really appreciate it dude like really top guy top yeah, man thank you top man you're doing some thank great you. stuff thank and, yeah uh, thank you for having me i really appreciate it it's, it's, it's um, very frustrating just purely because you know, with the foundation, you're trying to do mm. things. I'm speaking up against certain topics and, and so mm. on, but mm. ultimately we are looking to help others. And there's a lot of people who want to try and bring the foundation down or bring certain stuff down, but we just keep going. We keep helping people. That's all we, that's all we can try keep and do. on doing. Keep shining that light. <laughs> that's what we're trying. Do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, man. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, this has been Raising the Bar and with my amazing guest, David Cottrell.